Good morning, welcome back to United View. Hope everyone is doing very well. Welcome back to another edition of the Morning View. It's here, it's Friday. Yeah, is it Good Friday today? I think it is, isn't it? I, did that. I mean, this would be a good thing to check before I even started. I think it is Good Friday. Let's have a look. Straight off the bat, I mean, this is what this is what we do for the solo shows, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Good Friday. Happy Good Friday to everyone that, that celebrates. It's the Easter weekend. I was thinking that. Um, yeah, it's a long weekend. Bank holiday weekend for all those uh, here in the UK, at least, certainly. So, indeed, happy Good Friday. Happy Friday. End of the week. What are your plans? What are you doing? Are you Are you resting up? Are you taking it easy? Have you got plans for a long weekend? Of course, football is back tomorrow for Manchester United. A trip to Brentford. Got to exercise some demons. Oh my goodness me! An evening kickoff, a really late kickoff actually, uh, as well. Eight o'clock. Those late kickoffs on a Saturday, not for me. Not for me, certainly. But we're going to be uh, back tomorrow with the match view and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to be very, very fun indeed. But how's everybody doing? How's everybody doing? Be sure to click the like button. Be sure to subscribe, bottom right-hand corner. I can see everyone in the chat already. Got Sophia saying, morning all. JJ says, good morning, UV family. Happy Good Friday to everyone. Uh, Nessie says, happy Good Friday. Starlord says, top of the morning. Uh, what else people saying here? Uh, Stanley says, big up UV family. Love from South Africa. Marion says, morning Owen and UV family. Shane says, good morning, everyone. Chris says, it's 5 a.m. here. Getting up and going to work. There's still going to be people working. Big up to you, Chris, on the grind as well. Steffi Jenk says, morning, Owen. Uh, Andy says, 3 a.m. kickoff here in, in Thailand. Oh, of course, yeah. Uh, because of the uh, because of the changes as well, certainly indeed. Um, but yes, good morning. Nick says morning, lads. Uh, Dogger says good morning, Owen. Um, uh, Olaf from Peru. There you go as well. The global community is in full effect this morning. So yes, hope everyone's doing well, having a good Friday. We got plenty to uh, to get into, plenty to talk about this morning. We're going to be talking a little bit about Dan Ashworth. We're going to be talking about how negotiations really have come to a standstill over the Newcastle sporting director who's on gardening leave, set to become the Manchester United sporting director, director of football. I'm not sure what his official title is going to be, but it does look like negotiations are really stored and there is a standoff between Newcastle and Manchester United. We'll be chatting about that. I also want to talk about Gary Neville as he's uh, really backed... I, I think for the first time that I can recall, Gary Neville has really forthright come out and said, Man United should really stick by Eric Ten Hag. And he sort of dismissed and uh, pushed back on all of the names that have been linked to the Manchester United job, whether it's Gareth Southgate, Gary O'Neill, Graham Potter, as sort of beneath Manchester United and not up to the quality of what is and should be a Manchester United calibre head coach or manager. So we'll be talking about what he said on his uh, overlap fan debate and also a bit more of an update from David Orn on the Gareth Southgate yuck to Manchester United rumours as well and anything else that happens whilst we're live so there is so much to get into this morning so strap in get yourself a cup of coffee that cup is absolutely boiling I wanted to have a sip before I went live that's why I was a little bit late because I was looking at the time going oh, but I, like I said I take my coffee black nothing else in it and it just means that it's, it's too hot. It's too hot. Someone did uh, shout out to them. Someone did put a tip in the chat uh, in the chat in the chat the other day, and it was put ice cubes in it. And I hadn't thought of that. I had not thought of that. And that's a good that's a good idea. Put it in. We'll take the temperature down. Smart. But that would require me to do a bit more of sort of forward thinking and actually make sure I've got some ice cubes ready and made, which. It's not really. I'm, I mean, I'm organised, but I'm not that organised, you know. But maybe in the future, definitely in the summer. That's what I'll have to do when it gets hot. Yeah, difficult. Nevertheless, I'm getting off track already. Let's talk. Let's talk about Dan Ashworth and let's talk about the standoff between Manchester United and Newcastle United uh, for him as well. So we've got quite a lot to get through actually here when it comes to these quotes. So bear with me. The first of which comes from Matt Hughes who is saying that Manchester United and Newcastle are refusing to compromise in the standoff over Dan Ashworth, with both clubs planning for a summer transfer window without having a sporting director in place. Because, of course, 
if Dan Ashworth is on gardening leave for Newcastle in that role, I don't know if they can actually... I mean, someone who would know, like, employment law better than I, can they hire a, repl- a replacement if he's still in place? Does that Can they still technically do that? I don't know how that actually, how that works. But the suggestion is that Newcastle, they might not have one in place, and Manchester United might not have one in place either. It continues by saying that Newcastle are content with letting head of recruitment Steve Nixon mastermind their summer transfer plans after placing Ashworth on gardening leave, while United are adamant they will not meet demands for £20 million in compensation, with incoming chief executive Omar Barada expected to take, take charge of negotiations in the interim. Now, David Ornstein has kind of expanded on this and really it's kind of the same story, it must be said. But this is what uh, he's sort of saying, that there's no real updates. He was asked if there was any updates or any breakthroughs in the talks between Manchester United and Newcastle over Dan Ashworth. And he said, quote, I'm not aware of any breakthrough yet in talks with Newcastle over Ashworth. Unless that happens, and you have to think it will at some point, I think he's on a five-year contract with a nine-month notice period. I need to double-check that to be certain. Newcastle wanted slash want 20 million pounds and Manchester United don't intend to pay anywhere near that. Uh, United will look at what Newcastle paid Brighton, consider how long he's been at Newcastle and be reluctant to pay much more. They seem happy to bide their time if needed. Should that continue to be the case, Newcastle will need to consider whether they want to continue paying Ashworth his full salary to sit at home during doing nothing for them. United are also waiting for Omar Barada to start as CEO this summer, but they could recruit somebody else in the meantime. It has been well documented that there is some admiration for Julian Ward and he would be available to start immediately, but indications are that he will not be joining. Jason Wilcox is a target I revealed some time ago and I imagine that a deal with Southampton would be more straightforward than Ashworth's with Newcastle, but again, United will need it to be right for them, especially with the profit and sustainability regulations, a lingering concern before proceeding. Finally, he says they will have other options too. Many meetings and conversations are taking place with many candidates for many positions. Some patients will be required to see exactly what the new setup looks like. And even then, it's sure to evolve as Ineos finds its feet and Barada begins his post. So really the latest update when it comes to Dan Ashworth is that it's the same as it was a few weeks ago when we had uh, that interview or Flex did that interview with Keith Downey here on the channel, which I would still recommend because it's, it holds up. <laughs> uh, when was that? A couple of months ago at this point? a few, At least a month ago, I think, uh, or so. And really the state of play is exactly the same, which is Newcastle want £20 million. Manchester United are like, we're definitely not going to pay you £20 million. They've got a guy that's on gardening leave and you've got sort of two clubs, Newcastle more than United certainly, but you've got two clubs that are, you know, very much on the line with PSR and profit and sustainability uh, rules and, uh, you know, a possible breach. Now, what was really interesting with uh, Keith Downey when he did that interview with Flex is he pointed out that actually Dan Ashworth could be seen as a bit of a, uh, as a bit of a golden ticket for Newcastle in the sense that, where it looks like they're going to finish this year in the Premier League. I mean, it looks really like Newcastle are going to finish, what, ninth, 10th, mid-table, something along those lines. It doesn't look like, obviously, they're going to get Champions League football, let alone just European football in general. They could see how the rest of the season plays out, of course. But it looks like they're going to maybe not even be in Europe next season. And with the money they've spent since the Saudi PIF purchased the club, and with no European football next season, the kind of rumour was that they would have to have a big sale in the summer with at least one of their big players having to leave the club. But Keith Downey revealed here on the channel that Dan Ashworth could be seen as a sort of reason not to do that because if they got £20 million for Dan Ashworth, then maybe they wouldn't have to sell a Bruno Gimaresh or a Alexander Isak or someone like that. So Newcastle are still trying to play hardball with that. But from a Manchester United point of view, they kind of realise, well... We, we do have the leverage in this situation, we do, because it's not as if Dan Ashworth is still at Newcastle doing his day-to-day job. Dan Ashworth is on gardening leave. Dan Ashworth will end up at Manchester United. There would Something pretty, a, a proper left turn would have to happen at this point, wouldn't it, really, for Dan Ashworth not to end up in post at United. It's just a case of when. Is it going to be immediate in the summer? Are United going to cough up that money? Which we already know. 
It's not going to happen. Is it going to be after the transfer window has concluded? So at the end of August, beginning of September, is it going to be at the beginning of 2025? Is he going to have to sit out for the remainder of this calendar year? Is it going to be then? And the longer it takes, obviously, the less compensation Manchester United are going to give Newcastle United. But I still think that United are in the position of power here. Um, they're clearly prepared to wait, which has always been the line from the start. And I know that as United fans, it's a bit of a concern, isn't it? When we say we're prepared to wait because we are naturally impatient and we have this desire for Manchester United to have a big summer window because it's we know the importance of what's coming up this summer. And Flex and myself spoke about it yesterday and all of you guys in the chat have spoken about it extensively. I think we're all curious as to what this is going to look like, what the summer is going to look like. The, the, the transfer windows for United in the last decade have become really totally predictable. And last year was a great example of this. You know, we dilly-dally for ages. Other clubs do business very quickly or fairly quickly and we get a bit concerned. We get sort of one signing through the door before we go on tour in July. That signing goes, goes out on tour with them. We then tend to do another signing whilst we're on tour, but they don't join us on tour. They join us once we get back from tour. And then we tend to do two signings once the season has started. And it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of around that kind of, that's the kind of pattern. Oh, and also they're worked on one player at a time. Every single negotiation is really stretched out, really, really stretched out to the point of it's nauseating and eye rolling. We put in two bids that we know are going to get rejected and it's on the third bid that it gets accepted. It's predictable. And it's just, it's, and and then also, by the way, the players that we do bring in, a couple of years after the fact, we go, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I'm not really sure they worked out. <laughs> I'm not really sure this player's working out, Manchester United. That's how it works. So the hope is that that's not going to be the case anymore, isn't it? The hope is that that has changed or that will change. But the proof will always be in the pudding. And we know what we have to do come this summer. We're hoping that Manchester United act differently and also we're hoping that Manchester United can also do something they haven't been able to do previously which is those players which historically have been difficult to sell we can actually get them out of the club for a deal that actually benefits Manchester United and doesn't leave us completely in the hole so it's a big summer and because of that and because of everything I mentioned I think as fans, we're like, oh, okay, just get these guys in. Get Dan Ashworth in. Get Omar Barada in. Get Jason Wilcox in. Get someone else in. Have this team ready to go. And then we're going to hit the summer rolling. We're going to sign these players. These players are going to go. Then Manchester United, it's going to be like 2013 all over again. Or rather, sort of 2012, 2013 all over again. Manchester United will be back. And we'll be competing for titles, competing for Champions League. And it's going to be brilliant. And the reality is often a little bit disappointing with that because... It's going to take longer, isn't it? It's going to take longer. It's going to be a bit more drawn out because of contracts, because of negotiations. And it might be a situation where, because Ineos have deemed Dan Ashworth as the best in class, then the best in class means it takes a little bit longer to get the best in class. So Dan Ashworth, as, as time goes on, it looks like maybe he won't be in, in, in place for the summer. Maybe. Time will tell. See if Newcastle buckle, as I mentioned. The, as the season continues on and as PSR and FFP gets tighter, particularly for Newcastle, maybe they will buckle when it comes to that. And they'll be like, right, we just we can take a little bit less and he can start. I don't know. He can start after the fact. He can start after the transfer window or something. Um, in the interim, as they're saying, it looks like Omar Barada is going to be doing the negotiations. But I don't think it'll just be him, him in. Obviously, other people are going to come as well. But I think they're trying to figure out... Um, what happens when it comes to Dan Ashworth first? But it also then leads the uh, it also then leads to the question, doesn't it, about um, about Eric Ten Hag? It it depends about what happens with Eric Ten Hag because the reports were just last week that the decision on Eric Ten Hag's future wasn't going to be solely down or judged upon rather by Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Sir Dave Brailsford. They were going to listen and lean into the advice from Omar Barada and Dan Ashworth. And that was one of the reasons they're kind of waiting is to get these people in place first so they can do their analysis and then give their verdict to, to Jim Ratcliffe and Brailsford. But if they're not in place, can they even do that? Does it get dragged out even more? I don't know. 
So these are these things that still need to be put in place. But I am, but I do prefer that it is like this. I still do think, and I and I will always stick by this. That um, I, I'll stick by this. That this is still the right way to do it. The right way to do it still is get the structure in place first. Do it step by step. Get the right people in. And then make the decisions on managers, transfers, etc. What you don't want to do is do a Chelsea where it's just go in, all oh, these new owners, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. Directors and all these people leave like once the season started or as, as you're in the middle of pre-season. Then once the season's just started, you go, actually, we're going to get rid of the manager, bring a new one in. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the latest thing with Chelsea. It was... Um, who, it was Mike Keegan, I think, yesterday, or someone from the Mail, were saying that... Uh, Every was it every five years, I think it is. They switch chairmans, the co owners get a new turn, <laughs> they, they take turns to be the chairman <laughs> every five years. I was just thinking, oh my, what a mess! What a mess that is. Every five years, your turn now, you get to run it for five years. All right, I won't do what you did, Todd. You bloody oh, oh what will do what he did. Imagine they go, I'm gonna, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do it completely different for the next five years. Oh. <laughs> okay, where is the long-term planning there? What a mess Chelsea is. And that is why I will always push back on those people. Always push back on those people. that They still do it today, by the way, that give it Chelsea way further ahead in the project than Manchester United are. Have you seen Chelsea? Have you seen how they're run? Have you seen the problems that they have as well? Yeah, it is a mess with Chelsea. That football club, it's, it's barely a football club anymore, how they're run. It is crazy. And never again do we do the whole Chelsea are further ahead in the project than Manchester United. Not a chance. They are a catastrophe. What an absolute mess. So yes, that is the latest when it comes to Dan Ashworth. Uh, be sure to uh, click the like button. Be sure to subscribe, bottom right-hand corner. We've got over 750 people watching. Just over 100 likes. Let's see if we can get it to uh, 250. Chima's very angry. I've seen this here. Um... <laughs> Owen, listen, listen, get my badge back now. Do you mean your uh, your membership badge? I mean, <laughs> I, I would think that's probably a you thing, Chima, to be honest. <laughs> like, you might have run out. <laughs> or, you know, that's kind of, you know, I can, it's back. I can't, I can't, really, can't really do anything about that. I mean, sometimes with the badges or whatever, sometimes people get gifted memberships and they pop up, but... That's what they are. They're like gifts and they then they disappear. That's kind of how it works, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not really sure what to do. But uh, maybe less of the shouting because no one gets anything from shouting, do they? At all. Not, not at all. No one gets anything by that. I mean, my goodness me, Chima. It's, it's 9.22 in the morning. Let's all settle down. Let's, okay, that's fine. Let's, let's, let's calm down a little bit, Chima. <laughs> Do a Dan Ashworth. Wait nine months for it, yeah? That's, 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 that's all right. <laughs> I, I, what I like as well with it is it's also, it's the caps locks. And then it's, I'm not, I'm so angry, I've got to just do an emoji. And that's what we've got to do. I've got to put an emoji on it as well. <laughs> it's all right. It's fine, Chiba. Let's get to the super chats as well. Um, maybe, maybe the badge is on garden leaf. Maybe that's what it is. Red Baron says, um, "Flex, can't wait to see you in your waistcoat when England crash out of the Euro." If you're watching, I wish you could talk to Rory about this manager. Well, um, we'll see what happens come the summer with Flex. You know, he likes to do this whole. I'm, oh, I'm just doing devil's advocate. I'm just doing devil. Well, he likes to do it until people start to call him out on it. And then he goes, no, I'm only, well, I'm only joking. You saw him on the Trinity last week. Go and watch it. we got another episode today. 6 p.m. is going to be coming out. And uh, if it gets brought up, because I don't even like talking about it that much. We've got to talk about Southgate later on. And I don't want it to become like I'm Woody from Toy Story. You know, you pull the string and I say the catchphrase. Oh, Southgate, I don't like him. Pull the string. Play the greatest hits. But um, yeah, if you're going to do the whole devil's advocate stuff, when people start saying, all right then, Gareth Southgate fan, what do you think? No, I'm only joking. I'm a, no, no, I'm only joking. Hey, let's see what happens. Uh, Red Baron also says, Kenny hates Mertenez and Flex wants Southgate as Man United's manager. Pass these rumours on. If you repeat a lie enough, it becomes true. Wow. Yeah. Kenny's... That, that That's what is funny with Kenny as well, is uh, that's the one thing that people... 
it's th that this is what's crazy about the internet and like YouTube and this space is you can say 10 million things and if 99.99% of them are positive it's the 0.01% thing that you say is maybe a little off the beaten path uh, Martin, uh, Martinez is injury prone and it's Kenny hates Martinez that's the truth he doesn't like him he's never been a fan of the butcher he's a vegetarian <laughs> uh Steffi Jenks been a member for 18 months big up to Steffi one of the longtime members supporters and moderators saying thank you uh, everyone for being here always appreciate your support and mutual love and respect here in the chat yes absolutely big up to Steffi Jenks long time mod one of the OGs and uncle says nine months from September uh, from January September uh, they will definitely have to sell a big player in the summer then let Ashworth go for free next month their loss like I said, I think it's going to be uh, interesting to see how the rest of the season plays out with Newcastle because they're in a tight spot when it comes to... Um, they're in a very tight spot when it comes to FFP and PSR, aren't they? So something's going to have to give eventually with, uh, with them. And whether that's Ashworth, whether that's a player, whether it's something else, we shall see. We shall see. Uh, let's move on. And let's talk about uh, Eric Ten Hag. Let's talk about what Gary Neville has said about Eric Ten Hag back in the Manchester United manager and kind of dismissing all of these other names that have been linked with the managerial role at Manchester United. So this was in the Overlaps uh, fan debate. And Gary Neville said the following. He said, quote, Everywhere I look, I just think to myself, we could end up with someone who's probably not as good as Eric Ten Hag or got the pedigree of him. And he's actually got two years of experience. And the fact he's had that good first season and he's experienced that difficulty means that he should be better for it. He continued by saying, so I think that I would like to see that. I don't like the idea of him leaving and bringing in one of these names that have been suggested. That doesn't feel right. I'd rather stick with Eric Ten Hag and think, right, OK, let's just give him, I wouldn't even say another year. I'd say just believe in him. He also, when talking about you know, the likes of Gareth Southgate, Gary O'Neill and others, he said, I said on Stick to Football last week that even Gareth, as well as Gareth's done with England, debatable, I've never seen that fit between Gareth and United. I've never seen the fit between Graham Potter and United. And that's been a strong rumour. I don't see the fit between Gary O'Neill and United. So Gary Neville, very much on the line, which I would say... It and I know whenever you talk about Ten Hag, you get the people that are very anti-Ten Hag going, you don't speak for all of us, you can't speak for all of us. So let me just stress, I, I'm, I would never, <laughs> I can't speak for everyone, I can speak for myself. But from my perception anyway, from my perception, I think Gary Neville's views, views there are with the majority, which is that Eric Ten Hag... Uh, should probably be given more time, be given an, um, another year or backed him. Or certainly, at the very least, Eric Ten Hag over these people that have been linked. Maybe that's more fair to say as well, right? Because, and that's been part of the problem, hasn't it? Of of all of these people that have been linked to um, to the Manchester United job over the last two weeks, an international break, just coincidentally, when they've got nothing to write about and you've got to write about something. These people that have been linked to the United job I mean, let's just be brutally honest here. They're just nowhere near the quality that would be required. You know, it's one thing, isn't it? If, if you're talking about Eric Ten Hag being replaced by, you know, a, a Nagelsmann or a Hansi Flick or people when they say Ancelotti, which is not going to happen. But like some people that have won things or won titles in the past, that's when you go, right, I can at least see the logic of them thinking, oh, this is a guy that's won, you know, trophies here. So I get it. But when it's, People like, with respect, Gareth Southgate, Graham Potter, Gary O'Neill. That's when you go, well, what? what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> this just seems ridiculous. This just seems, it seems like there's a headline. Let's just pick a random name from the Premier League. Gary O'Neill. Or let's just pick uh, Graham Potter. Uh, it's international break, isn't it? Gareth Southgate, put him in the headline. It kind of feels like that, doesn't it? And as I spoke about last week on the Trinity, that I, I do think it has kind of been overlooked. And I know this comes with the territory as the Manchester United manager, but it has been kind of overlooked of the sort of level of disrespect to him from the media is astounding, isn't it? There is a double standard when it comes to all of this. I mean, the speculation surrounding him, it's inevitable when you don't have a good season and it's inevitable when you've got new people in that have... Uh, 
you know, a say or the entire say over football operations at the club, like that is inevitable. But the sheer what feels like desperation from the media to get Eric Ten Hag to lose his job or be replaced by one of these names that they know will draw headlines. It's like they're planting the seeds for something else to happen in the future. And we're getting into nearly the spring right now. You know, you start planting your seeds and you hope come the summer they blossom into a beautiful flower. That's almost what they're trying to do for Eric Ten Hag or the Manchester United managerial job. Make no mistake, they're not idiots. They realise that if Gareth Southgate became the Manchester United manager, it would be a media frenzy and a media meltdown. Why? Because he's the England manager and he gets a lot of press anyway, but also because he shouldn't be in that job, because he's not good enough for that job. So the pundits would be talking about it, the fans would be in a total meltdown because the fans know, and the fans aren't afraid to say what seemingly some of the pundits and the journalists are afraid to say every time they go on television and talk about Gareth Southgate. It'd be the same if it was Gary O'Neill. They'd be like, There'd be a meltdown because it'd be like, well, whilst Gary Neal was a great coach, the, the the head coach or the manager of Manchester United, what? What are we talking about here? Same with Graham Potter. It'd be like, what? The same Graham Potter that, you know, <laughs> catastrophically failed at Chelsea, which, look, it's not an easy job. Look at Poch. But the same Graham Potter that just these guys that just are not qualified, not qualified at all to be uh, the Manchester United manager, they're planting those seeds in the hope that it would happen in the future. And if I'm Eric Ten Hag and I'm in um, and I'm in the, the press conference, um, where's one today, actually? I'm going to be live at two o'clock. But if I'm going to be, if I'm in this press conference, yeah, and I'm looking at uh, all of these journalists, I'm looking at these, looking at them going, you son of a bitch, all of these people. Like, you've been writing about me for the last two weeks. Bear in mind, after... After, <laughs> after I knocked Liverpool out of the FA Cup, knocked our biggest rivals out of the FA Cup in a game that nobody thought we were going to win in dramatic style. And instead of sort of celebrating that for two weeks, instead, you've been writing about all of these people that are going to replace me, right? Seriously? Seriously? Is, is, that, is that what we're going to do? Like, oh, it's just, it's crazy. It's absolute crazy. And again, I think that is a, a next level of, of disrespect too. So... Yeah, I think that with Gary Neville, in terms of what he's saying there, that does seem to be sort of the prevailing theory, doesn't it? Or the prevailing point of view at the moment that um, that maybe Eric Ten Hag should be given more time and, and see what happens in the new structure. At the same time, I I still say, I, I say uh, when it comes to, to Ten Hag, when it comes to his future, I think the perception of it and him is probably going to change at least what two or three more times <laughs> two two or three more times in um for the, this for the rest of this season and the reason i say that is because the story of what happens for the rest of the season is going to uh, it's going to change too because inevitably there'll be a game that we uh, that we lose then Eric Ten Hag will be terrible and he'll be rubbish again and we should get rid of him then there'll be a few games that we win then it will be actually Maybe Eric Ten Hag is the right guy. It's the players. We need to get rid of these players. Back Eric Ten Hag. Then there'll be some games that we win, but we don't play very well. And it's like, I know we're not, I know we're playing, I know we're getting results, but oh, I'm not sure. Like that, that will happen over and over and over and over and over again. That's what's, um, that, that's what will happen. Um, because look, after the momentum that we've generated by knocking Liverpool out of the FA Cup and getting to a semi final, the expectation is that we'll, um, that will that will be getting to um that we that we'll get into a final rather um if we lose to brentford and i don't think we will but if we did lose to brentford then suddenly it'll be once again oh it's all for nothing we're terrible we're rubbish eric ten hag's terrible eric ten hag's rubbish like so that, that my point is that this is going to happen over and over and over again that's what's going to happen so yeah i think that uh but, but at the same time the the reason why you know the momentum's now with Ten Hag again is because um, we did just not Liverpool out and the season has opened up a bit more, hasn't it? I mean, a couple of weeks ago, well, a couple of weeks ago was that game, but a month or so ago, shall we say, a month or so ago, if you looked at what was possible to get out of um, 
what was possible to get out of this season, it looked like nothing. It didn't look like we were going to get the Champions League. It didn't look like we were going to win any trophies. People assumed we were going to get knocked out of the FA Cup by Liverpool and we'd probably finish sixth or something like that, right? That's what people, um, that's what people think. So now you look at the clubs in Europe, they helped us out. They did something we couldn't do, which is do well in a European competition. So fifth spots opened up. The clubs above us have started to drop points and you get to that stage of the season where people are um, where people are looking at uh, people's fixtures and seeing who they've got and, okay, how many points were they going to drop? How many points are we going to drop? Can we jump over them? Like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? All that. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's what the stage of the season is. And there'll be many ups and downs and with those ups and downs will come the uh, the, the the changes in perception of Ericsson Haag as well. Um what I will say, by the way, guys, is like the chat is going mad at the moment, okay? And I don't know what it is, but I would say that. Just a reminder, there are like community rules of this. Stay respectful. Uh, stay kind. Keep it to football. Everyone's allowed different opinions, but don't go over the top. I know that this is 2024 and apparently debate is gone and you have to be jumping down each other's throats and being uncivilized, but... Again, Ed, uh, stick to the rules. Big up to the mods in the chat as well, because they're doing their best. But yeah, let's let's keep it calm down, all right? <laughs> let's calm it down. Um, yeah, and uh, make sure that we're we're all settled. Okay, we're all we're all part of the same community. Okay, it's it's all it's all right. And also, like it's it's YouTube. You don't have to scream at each other. <laughs> like there are bigger and more important things in life to get angry at people on the internet. Okay, chill calm down if people if people are going crazy then the mods they will sort it if uh if it's too much then you can close the app you can turn off the chat you don't have to you know that's that's it okay that's that's it those rules are in place for a reason so chill it's cool it's cool um we got nearly 900 people watching be sure to click the like button be sure to subscribe bottom right hand corner um as well i think uh well, there's a couple of uh, super chats here as well here at the moment too um what have we got here? Duh, 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 duh. Uh, Kenny Fan TV says, um, if you guys want to see the Flex and Kennedy show, give me a hell yeah. Just joking. Big up Owen. Wow. Uh, Kenny Fan TV's pitching his own show here today, but uh, appreciate the contribution. Red Baron says, blame Mark uh, Ogdonut. Uh, Mark Ogden was big on the naming every single person that could replace Ericsson Haag, wasn't he? He really, really was. Uh, so was ESPN. I mean, ESPN, it must be said, yeah. And um, I don't mind Rob Dawson as well. He seems like a nice enough guy. Um, but um, who's the guy? Is it Stevie Nichol? Is that his name? The the Liverpool guy in America? My goodness me. Whenever you see, I mean, obviously we don't really get over here in the UK. We don't really get ESPN that much. You can obviously, you can watch those shows, which he's on. I think they show them on TNT over here. But um, you don't really see it that much. You maybe see it on social media uh, and what have you. But... I don't understand the the point of being a pundit when you can't be unbiased or you can't like for for me if I was a pundit on television and thank God I'm not but if if I'm on here if I'm on here if I'm doing a show here I was doing a show anywhere else and someone asked me about Liverpool the fact that I don't like Liverpool would not stop me enough from objectively calling what I'm seeing for instance if Liverpool played well I'd go Liverpool played well because that's the truth. That's the reality. I don't see the point of pundits whose job it is to analyze the game and provide expert analysis because they've played the game and, you know, tactically they know more than us, I guess, that will ignore the truth in favor of their biased opinion just because they don't like the club because they played for their rival 20 odd years ago. That to me is just complete madness and not what people watch for or in certain cases pay for imagine that you pay for your subscription you pay for your your cable package satellite package whatever and you get biased analysis of a game that you're trying to understand more about isn't their job again to analyze the game and give their expert opinion on what you're seeing to educate and to say this is why this happened and this is why this worked this is why it didn't work not I used to play for Liverpool, so I hate Manchester United. So I'm not going to offer any kind of praise or any kind of <laughs> punditry. I just don't like them. You go, what are we doing? It's like I always say with Jamie Carragher, he should not be on uh, co-commentary for Liverpool games. He offers nothing. Unless you're a Liverpool fan, of course. If you're a Liverpool fan, then it's great because it's like you're watching it with your, with your friends because you've got a Liverpool fan on comms. But 
I, it, there is no expert like objective down the line. Any 50-50, it should be Liverpool. That's what he's like. Any kind of booking, no. Like when Odegaard, the celebrating thing, oh, I just get off the pitch. What are you, what are you offering? <laughs> Seriously, what are you offering? And it's kind of like, I think nowadays they do it because outrage, people, with, people will, will chat more or people will get on social media more about outrage, about things that are bad than rather than things that are good. So outrage gets more engagement, I guess, for, for them. I just don't understand it at all. I think it's I think it's bizarre. Uh, Aminor with a super chat says, some Manchester United fans say that Eric Ten Hag has catfished them by not having a style of play. Lies. He is a fraud. Uh, therefore, they keep sacking managers until we get it right. Has catfished them by style of play. Lies. He is a fraud. So you're saying they are? He is a fraud? He's not a fraud? I don't know. I'm not really sure the, uh, the <laughs> what direction that was going in Aminor, but big up. Uh, Nick says, uh, love the fact and appreciate the contribution. Says, love the fact that Eric is so stern and focused. Everyone tries to criticize and get him sacked, yet he doesn't budge an inch. He doesn't care about the media one bit. Must be enraging for the media. And I do think uh, it must be said with Eric Ten Hag, yeah. I really, I really do think that um, that is part of the problem with the media with him is that he's not he, he's he's not this like i don't know super endearing character or super endearing personality in the same vein of like an Ange Postacoglu i mean that that should be studied with Postacoglu yeah and let's see what happens with Spurs for the remainder of the season but the leeway that that guy has been given this season, just because the media like him. And look, I like him. I think he's a nice guy. I do like the way he talks, but that doesn't cloud my judgment of when Spurs go to Craven Cottage and lose 3-0. I don't get any criticism. Yeah, he's a nice guy though, isn't he? He's a nice guy. So? <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> that doesn't matter. And the kind of, you do look at the sort of double standard of the scrutiny that other people get because the media have decided, they've anointed we like him, so it doesn't matter. And it's the same. It's always been like this with Jurgen Klopp, isn't it? People love the Jurgen Klopp and the fist bumps and the running on the pitch and the celebrations on the touchline and how crazy he is. And because of that, he gets away with a lot. He, he does. I mean, some of the stuff he's done on the touchline, even this season, but over his Liverpool tenure, has been disgraceful at points. Getting in the faces of fourth officials, running onto the pitch. I recall a time when Jose Mourinho was the Manchester United manager and he, like his foot just went across the line a little bit. His foot went across the line. I think it was against Southampton and he got sent off. Just a little bit across the line. And other managers, they can sprint on the pitch. It's no problem. And you go, well, that doesn't feel particularly fair, does it? So I do think to circle it back to Eric Ten Hag, I, I do think that um, with, with him, it part of it is because... I don't know, members of the media have just decided that he's not, I don't know, he's not engaging enough or he's not exciting enough or he's not this dynamic personality. So, that you know, they don't, that's not exciting enough for them or they don't like him. So we're just going to continue to write all this stuff about him. I do think that does play a big part in it. I really, really do. And what I do appreciate, I suppose, Eric Ten Hag is there's not this desire for him to turn that around. Who gives a shit? His, I think his perception is of, well, I'm, I'm a football manager. I, I don't care what you guys think about me. I don't care whether this journalist likes me or not. And it was, and it, and that's when it did really. It came to a head earlier this year, didn't it? With um, United banning those people from the press conference for for that uh, for that week, and that was because the media weren't playing fair anymore. They weren't playing by the rules and the sort of. And this is, and I think people don't really realize this, or maybe fans don't really realize this, but there is a relationship between journalists and the club, and the relationship is usually that the information they get is from the club a lot of the time, or from people close to the club. And any story that they do before they publish it, they always go to Manchester United and say, "Hey." This is the story we're putting out. We're going to be putting it out either today, tomorrow, or it's going to come out here. Have you got any comment on it? Are you going to refute any part of it? Can you tell me off the record if this is close or am I way off the mark or what's the official statement? Like that's that's how the relationship works. And earlier on this season, it was a case of they didn't do that. They started, they started even publishing things without going to United. They say they did. 
But, you know, it's quite interesting now that if you read any ESPN article about Manchester United at the end of it, they always now say, Manchester. we reached out to Manchester United for comment. They didn't respond. So they weren't doing that at the beginning of the season. Um, there is that relationship. So because of that, they got banned. And even the reaction to that was so, oh, didn't they get such in a twist about it? Uh, you can't do that. How dare they? Oh, I can't believe people are backing the manager or backing Manchester United for doing that. How dare they? How dare they? Well, how dare they? How dare you? Right, things that aren't true. How dare you um, constantly go for blood? And then, as I mentioned, when they're in these press conferences, they'll sit there, be nice, answer the questions. Goes both ways, isn't it? Respect. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. Uh, Super Chat here from V33 says, why do you need to endear to the media? Fergie uh, wasn't, uh, well, wasn't endearing himself much, I guess, is what you're saying there. I think maybe it is because the the nature of media has changed. You know, previously it was all, you know, the papers, wasn't it? All about the papers, the back pages, what have you. Whereas now, because it's so, there's an abundance of information and it's so instant, you don't have to wait, wait until tomorrow's papers. You don't even have to wait to see when it flashes up on the news on television. It's on social media two seconds after they said it. And also, it's not just the media, it's not just journalists nowadays, it's just people with large followings. They can dictate the perception of, of managers and the perception of players too. So they, I think, feel like, um, you know, that, that can also change the perception of how someone's viewed as well. So that's probably why. But um, Eric, I, it's very clear with that. I don't think Eric Ten Hag, he could, he could really care less, couldn't he? Absolutely uh, care less. Um, where are we at here as well? With likes, we're nearly at 1,000. Uh, we've got 220 likes. So if we haven't already, let's get uh, the likes up. Let's see if we can get to 300. Get to 300 or 350. Something like that as well. Yes. So if you haven't already, click the like button. Be sure to subscribe bottom right-hand corner. A reminder what's on tap for the rest of the day before we just get to this Gareth Southgate stuff as well. Uh, press conference is going to be coming up at um, 2. I think it's one. F well, this is what's weird with the Ten Hag press conferences. I think he has them at like one fifteen. The quotes are embargoed to one thirty, and then it gets shown at like one forty-five. So I'm going to be live at two ish. Don't hold me to that, but around that time because, and then sometimes he's late and that gets moved around too. So. I'm going to be live about two-ish <laughs> for the press conference later today for the game against Brentford. So be sure to join me uh, we're for that. And then 6 p.m. episode 9, I think. 9, I think, episode 9 of the Trinity. Flex, KG, myself. Plenty to talk about. Lots of people really enjoyed last week's episode. There was a bit of a Southgate rant from yours truly on there. Um, but hopefully we'll be talking about something other than Gareth Southgate today. So yes, that's going to be at 6 p.m. also as well. Uh, I did just see um, a tweet in the last couple of uh, seconds from uh, Insider United, a uh, friend of the channel. Um, big up to big up to them. Um, one of sort of uh, the rare people, I think, when it comes to sort of Twitter and social media that does get all this information and doesn't put all of it out because the thought process is, well, what's what do the fans need to know and what's detrimental to the team? And, you know, it's a big bugbear of mine, really, uh, the sort of leaking of team news on a match day, that kind of stuff. We never do it here uh, on the channel, really, um, particularly on social media, because there's just no benefit. I mean, obviously you can get followers and stuff like that from it, but it doesn't, doesn't really benefit anyone. But um, they do have a, a lot of good information inside of United and, um, yeah, a lot of it, uh, absolutely spot on uh, and they've just tweeted in just in the last couple of minutes saying that uh, Lissandro Martinez and Harry Maguire are still doubtful for Brentford um, a late fitness test is pending Casemiro looks good which is really interesting news actually that really really interesting news um, because the Maguire one not so much I think people had kind of assumed given the fact that he'd come back off international break with a knock was going for this scan they said it wasn't a big injury, but given the sort of proximity to the Brentford match, probably a bit too soon. Martinez won. I'd kind of, I kind of had thought that he might make it, to be honest. I thought, oh, maybe because he'd gone away with Argentina and he'd done the training there, hadn't played a game, but I thought he might make it. But that looks like it's not the case. I mean, maybe, maybe could make the bench, I suppose, as well. The Casemiro one's really curious, isn't it? Because 
Flex and myself were talking about this yesterday on the the preview. Be sure to check it out. But we were sort of saying we don't really know the state of play of Casemiro, and that's why the press conference today is going to be uh, really, really interesting, isn't it? Because with Casemiro, if the reports from Brazil are accurate, it was that he had this feeling in his hamstring, and it was oh, I don't know. I've got this pain here. Goes to the Manchester United medical department. They look it over. Go, no, you're fine. You can play. He goes, I'm no, I just. I got this pain. I'm going to go check it out, this doctor in Barcelona. The doctor in Barcelona then looks at Casemiro and goes, yep, there's a small thing here. It's small. It's small. But if you'd have played on it, it would have been made much worse. And that kind of reminded me of the Rasmus Hoyland issue earlier on this season when he signed for United, when they said he had that problem in his back. It wasn't a stress fracture. It was kind of like the precursor to it, whereby it's nothing you can just have to rest for a couple of weeks if you rest for a couple of weeks it will go away it's cool but if you played on it and if you aggravated it it could have turned into a stress fracture it could have turned into to much worse so maybe with Casemiro it was just a case of he just needed a couple of weeks he, he just he just needed a couple of uh, a couple of weeks to rest so according to Inside United which again very reputable um looking like Maguire doubtful Martinez Doubtful. I mean, I still maybe hold out hope you could maybe make the bench, something like that. Because for if you're looking forward to the Liverpool game in particular, you would hope maybe he would be back for then, maybe. But um, maybe maybe he does play against Chelsea. But then two games, four days between Chelsea and Liverpool, that might be a bit too much, possibly. Uh, but the Casemiro one, Casemiro does look good. So Casemiro could be back uh, in the midfield or at least on the bench. So uh, big up to Insider United for uh, for reporting that also too. Um, some super chats here as well. I did spot them out the corner of my eye too. Uh, duh, 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 duh. Red Baron says, uh, Ten Hag tried to play nice with the media earlier on in his career. Then he quickly realised after the conversation with Fergie not to do that. Well... <laughs> I think every manager tries to play nice with the media initially, uh, but then you. I think you're a fool if you're if you think that you've ever got the media on your side or you can do no wrong in the eyes of the media, particularly the Manchester United media scrum, because they've shown themselves many a time to be very quick to jump on anything. Remember when he said Newcastle were what was he Did he say horrible? Um, to play was it horrible the word he used I forget I don't want to misquote but I think I think he said horrible and you should have seen that room they literally like what do you, what do you, what do you mean what do you mean by that what do you mean by what do you, you said this you said this or even going back to his early times at United with like the Ronaldo stuff he mentioned anything about Ronaldo he would go I respect what do you mean by that what do you mean what do you mean what do you mean what do you mean by that going back to it um, and to the point where he'd be asked the question. I mean, it was so predictable, wasn't it? Especially at that time when he just came in. Like first, he wasn't even, it was pre-season. And it, the press conferences were so predictable, weren't they? Because it would be, uh, first question, Ronaldo. He'd do that, he'd, he'd ask it because he wasn't on the pre-season tour. Why is Ronaldo not on the tour? It's because of this, this and this. Okay, move on. There'd be a question. Okay, so how are you happy to be here? Yeah, happy to be here. Going back to Ronaldo, um, what was it about? Blah, 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 blah. And he'd go, I just answered that and he goes okay and then two seconds later so you, you mentioned Ronaldo what's going on I just said that like they, they don't care they don't care about that guy in the hot seat so if a manager ever thinks they do they don't ever at all annoying that was it big up Joffrey says uh, he said they were, they were annoying yes and immediately yeah, and you could tell as soon as he said it he realised he went oh oh damn I can't believe I can't, I can't believe I said it oh oh um, yeah, they, they'll jump on anything immediately. Um, Gareth Southgate, that's what I want to talk about. Gareth Southgate. So David Ornstein was asked a little bit more about these Gareth Southgate links and what have you. Uh, he said that Enios' decision makers definitely like and have links to Southgate. That's no secret. And there's nothing wrong with it. I beg to differ, David. He said they probably like a lot of coaches and managers, players and staff. He said today Brailsford knows Southgate well and they've spent time together over the years. Ashworth, of course, worked with Southgate at the FA, uh, but that does not automatically mean he is the top choice if a change is to be made or that he is going to be appointed there at all. He then says Southgate himself kind of quashed the possibility of it happening this summer and showed great respect to Eric Ten Hag, rightly so, because Ten Hag is in position and we have nothing concrete to suggest he will be leaving. 
He then said the new hierarchy at Old Trafford will be assessing everything, including Ten Hag, and Ten Hag will also be assessing them and his future. That is only natural as he approaches the final year of his contract, which includes an option to extend by a further 12 months. It appears no firm decisions have been made yet, and with so much still to play for, that feels sensible. So really, to conclude it all, the whole Gareth Southgate drama and palaver, this, that, and the other... David Ornstein there himself basically says there's nothing really to it. It's just pure hearsay. It's pure reaching. It's pure speculation. It's almost as if, it's almost as if there was two weeks of time to fill. We've got to write about something, guys. What are we going to talk about? It's Manchester United. Could we just talk about Liverpool and we're knocking them out of the FA Cup and how maybe we've got an opportunity to end the season on a high? No, let's not do that. Talk about Gareth coming to Man United. Or is there any talks and conversations? No. So why are we doing that? Why, well, you know, Dan Ashworth. Is he even at United yet? No. So not really a lot can really happen. And what, Ten Hag's definitely going to leave, is he? No. Not a decision's not been made. Gareth Southgate's definitely going to leave England, is he? No. So what are we doing here? I don't know. They like him. Well, good enough for me. Write it down. Go to press with it. Go to press for it right now. That's all it was. That's all it was. And um, he did notice over the last two weeks, didn't you, that the, the people that were you know, advocating for it the strongest were people that are not Manchester United fans. I certainly paid attention to that one as well. So there's nothing to it. The Gareth Southgate links. The decision's not been made and there is still, still a lot to play for this season. It didn't feel like that a few months ago, a few weeks ago, but certainly now there is. And I, I think it would... You'd, as, it'd be crazy even now. I... I don't even get me started with Gareth Southgate, whatever, to make him the United manager, even link him to the job. Let alone if Eriksen Hag qualified for the Champions League and won the FA Cup or even got to a final, people would be like, what? <laughs> what happened? Why'd you do that? And for people to use the Louis van Gaal precedent, replacing Eriksen Hag after he wins the FA Cup with Gareth Southgate is nothing like replacing Louis van Gaal after he wins the FA Cup with Jose Mourinho. Like, that is... I know people can say, well, it's the same thing. You replace a manager that won a cup, you know, a, a trophy with another manager. But to say that Gareth Southgate and Jose Mourinho are in any way the same breath, let, let alone the same position, it would be nuts. Absolutely nuts. So, yes, it's, that's, it's not a thing. Not happening. It's fine. Um, and, yeah, we, when it comes to Southgate, well can look forward to that in the summer can't we with the euros or certainly i can I'm going to be doing that all over again here on the channel um i tell you what it feels it feels like a lifetime ago that happened with the uh the qatar coverage um not the qatar by united qatar world cup um here at united view um but i loved it i i, I loved when we, when we did that so we're going to be doing that again in the summer we're going to be doing U uv euros uh, the asylum's going to be returning we're going to have my uh, my alternative commentary as well. Uh, and uh, who knows what moments we will get. Maybe we'll get another Panenka. Maybe we'll get... I don't I don't know. I mean, because that wasn't that wasn't planned or anything. Else. That was just screaming at the top of my lungs. So that's going to be coming back in the summer, which should be a lot of fun. So hopefully you can uh, all join me for that as well. Yes, it's going to be... Uh, I'm going to enjoy that immensely. Uh, I think I'm caught up when it comes to Super Chats. I am indeed. Appreciate everyone that's tuned in, got involved this morning. Uh, click the like button. Be sure to subscribe. As I mentioned, um, there's plenty to come today. Press conference. I'll be live around 2 ish whenever the uh, the quotes and what have you come out for the press conference of Eric Ten Hag and then later on today 6 p.m the trinity flex kg and myself the latest episode that will be dropping and then tomorrow of course it's match day so we'll have full match day coverage we'll have the road trip we'll have the match view remember guys you'll see it on the screen in just a second the match view starts two hours before kickoff so kickoffs at eight o'clock so i'll be live at six 
for the pre-match to give you all of the team news, um, some Eric Ten Hag quotes from his embargoed part of his press conference, some news stories and some, some general chit-chat about the game. And then 30 minutes before kickoff, so that's 7.30, we'll be going over live to UVHQ with Flex, KG and the whole panel as well. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and then after that, of course, we get fan views, full-time view, player rating. You know what it is. The match day coverage here at UV is unparalleled. So uh, be sure to join us then as well. But anyway, guys, have a good Friday. Hope you enjoy your day doing whatever you do. And I'll speak to you again later on. Peace.